Our speaker today is Joe Specia, superintendent of Buckeye Local Schools. He is in his second year with the school district. Uh, most recently, he had also been with the Hudson and Mentor School Districts in a variety of different administrative roles. Uh, Joe's going to talk a little bit today about some of the you know, curriculum changes and other focuses that uh, the school district is taking to better prepare students both for, for their future academic endeavors, but also more uh, also linking them more with career and workforce opportunities as well. Uh, about two years or so ago now, soon after Joe took over, uh, he made the point, he actually came in to talk to me and he wanted to you know, learn more about the local economy and the local business community here in Ashtabula County and figure out ways that you know, his school district could work more hand in hand with our local businesses. And he said something very interesting to me that day, and I don't know if he remembers, but you know, his, his perspective was, we need to be not just in the business of graduating students, as a school district, we should be in the business of preparing students to contribute to the local economy and the community as a whole. And I think that perspective has really shaped a lot of the things uh, that they've been doing uh, over the last year and a half, two years now, as far as their curriculum and incorporating the private sector more into their day-to-day uh, -day activities. So uh, I'll let Joe take it from there and uh, give kind of the highlights of what they have going on. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for coming out today and, and listening to a little bit about, about what we, we are doing over in Buckeye and providing you a, a little bit of perspective that might be helpful. Um, I want to begin, though, in, in thinking about this as, as this is a leadership group. Um, oftentimes, I think about leadership or what a leader does, or I'll say in this case, what does a superintendent do, and it really boils down to three things. The first of those three things is to have a vision, to know where you're going and know what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. And the second thing, and this is in no particular order, the second thing is be able to make a decision. And the third then is to build relationships. And I believe when, when a leader, whatever the organization is, can build relationships within his or her organization, um, and they have a vision, and they're able to make decisions, they can be successful. Um, and part of that is, I believe, what I'm part of it, all of that is true. And that's what we try to do in our school district. And, and I would suggest to you that the single most difficult decision that I make um, day to day is the one to keep or close school on days <laughs> like this. Um, and, and I would tell you that, that we make, and I was talking to Dr. Stocker, we make, you know, and, and all of you probably make hundreds of decisions today, but there is nothing that I like less than making that decision um, because you just never know. Um, so just so you know, and I'm speaking for every superintendent in the state of Ohio, and especially those guys in Ashtonville County, this is the least fun kind of day we have. Because yeah, whether well, there's a little bit here, a little bit there, maybe yes, maybe no. Mike Fitchett helps us out with some, some weather briefings and so forth, but we're still, it's guesswork. It's guesswork. So as you think about things today, you know, if you think about the most difficult decision you make, Think about getting up at oh 3:30 in the morning and trying to figure out whether the roads are nice enough, whether what the temperature is warm enough to send kids to school, and you get a sense of what we think about from time to time over in our uh, uh, environments. Anyway, so the Buckeye Local Schools. So what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And I think that's the key element. Is is we began with the idea is why do we exist, and what do we do, and why are we here? Okay, and the simple answer a lot of people will say, well, you educate kids. And there's truth to that, and we do that. And I think we do a good job of that. And I would suggest to you that every school district um, in, in which, with which I've been in contact, with which I've ever worked, um, wants to do a good job educating kids. Okay, that's only one part of what we do. We exist, more than anything else, for the betterment of the entire community. We exist so that when students come through our doors and then they graduate, they're able to contribute to our community. And our community could be the local community here in the local economy. It could be a, a national community and economy. It could be a worldwide community and economy. But we must, as school districts, as school entities, we must prepare our students to be successful outside of the walls of school. And one of the things that schools did for years and years and years is they produced graduates, maybe some of them in here, who were really good at school, but maybe not so much in other things. And what we heard from businesses is we're getting kids who don't show up to work. We're getting kids who can't pass the drug test. 
We're getting kids who just don't know how to work, they don't know how to do the things we need them to do. And when I first came to uh, Ashtonville County, I sat down with Brian, actually sat down with Dr. Stocker, and, and maybe other people in this room uh, talked to the county commissioners and anybody who would listen to me and say, okay, so what do we need to do? And we just kind of had these conversations. And one day I was sitting at a CAP meeting, the Community Action Panel, and I'm listening to the manufacturing community say that, you know what? We need employees. We need people who are going to do these jobs into the future. And that probably struck a chord with me. Because as I turned around and looked, and I was listening to, and, and I would probably not remember the exact person, but somehow um, I believe it was Tesla that gave her performance uh, products, said, you know, 50%, 50% of our employees will either retire or be eligible to retire in the next five years. And without replacement of those employees, our businesses are in trouble. And with those businesses, Ashville County is in trouble. So that struck me. And in line with conversations with Dr. Stocker, Dr. Dr. Stocker, I'm sorry, Brian, and, and so forth, um, we began to think about how do we do this differently and better. And here's what we came up with at, at, in, in the Buckeye Schools. We are establishing and developing three academies. And the three academies is where our students will go. They will select one of these academies as they enter the high school, and we will prepare them within those <laughs> academies to be successful in that particular area. And I want to highlight those academies for you today. The first will be, uh, we're calling it right now, uh, a workforce development academy. The purpose of this academy is to work hand in hand in preparing students to become productive workers in particular in the manufacturing workforce in our community. We are working with Gabriel Performance Products, we are working with um, Praxair, Ashta Chemical, and Gabriel in a, formal partner, in a formal partnership that we call the Buckeye Community Partnership in which we're partnering to build curriculum and we actually have built two courses that are going to be introduced next year to our students that every student at Edgewood High School will take and we're calling them Workforce Development 1 and Workforce Development 2 but those courses were built with the, the help of those four companies. What are the qualities of a productive employee you guys, you guys need? We built that into the curriculum. We looked at the, what's called the ACT Work Keys curriculum. We built that into the curriculum. So every one of our students will take those two courses. Our students will then work in job shadowing experiences, uh, field trip experiences, I hesitate to call internship experiences, but similar internship experiences within those four companies over their four years of high school. As they graduate, as they make their way through our curriculum in this workforce development, um, this workforce development academy, they will be prepared to walk into jobs in one of those four companies or other companies, and, and we've had some other uh, companies express interest in becoming involved, um, but they'll be able to walk into entry level jobs that are paying between 20 and $25 an hour, sometimes up to $30 an hour. Um, we pay first year teachers in our district, oh, $32,000 and change. A $20 an hour job at Praxair or at Gabriel or at Ashton will pay, will pay an 18 year old person $40,000 an hour. It will put them in a position to begin making progress to be a productive member of our community and to contribute to the economic climate of Ashtonville County. We will have for them, we will put them in a position where they will have the work skills that will be attractive to each and every one of you. Now, there is all sorts of data out there. There's all sorts of information out there that says, well, you know, kids need advanced training, they need a college degree, and, and so on and so forth. So our Workforce Development Academy isn't built around the model of vocational education, you get your, your you go through, you get your, your certificate, and then you just go off to work. The Workforce Academy is built into it structures that will give the kids the advanced training beyond high school. Because there's no doubt that in the advanced world of manufacturing in Asheville County and, and around the country, students will need advanced training. They'll need to continue to uh, learn and grow. So built into our academies is this idea of long-term um, education, lifelong education for those graduates. So we are not looking at those kids as this is the end game, graduate from Metro High School and that's the end. 
the end game never really, you never really reach the end because they're always going to be learning and growing. And part of the academy that we're building <coughs> is to teach kids those skills. So that's the workforce academy. Okay. Um, hard to say how many kids will enter that academy. I will say this, about 55% of our kids, this is self-report, say they're going to college or go to college. Okay, of those 55%, the six-year persistence rate and the six-year graduation rate for our kids is about 50%. So in reality, only about 25 or 30% of our kids actually graduate from college, a four-year degree, um, in six years. So what we want to make sure is everybody who leaves our, our halls is going to be well prepared to be successful. Okay, so that's the workforce piece of it. The second piece is a STEM Academy, and our STEM Academy is, um, and most people know what STEM is, but, but just to clarify, STEM is, are the disciplines of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And STEM right now, and sometimes they call it STEAM because they have the arts to the um, idea, uh, but the STEM Academy, our STEM Academy is designed for students who have interest in one of those four disciplines. Our goal in that academy is to provide students with the opportunity to engage in dual enrollment coursework, so that's college and high school coursework simultaneously, or post-secondary um, opportunities, either coming to the Kent State Ashton Dual and taking courses here on campus, um, and or uh, taking advanced placement courses, which give students an opportunity to earn college credit while still in high school as well. Our goal in the STEM Academy, and, and this is a goal, and, and we believe in the stretch, but our goal in the STEM Academy is for our kids to graduate simultaneously with an associate's degree and a high school diploma. And like I said, that's a stretch, but we believe in that stretch because we need for kids to believe in themselves enough to stretch like that. Okay, so our STEM students, our ultimate goal is for those guys to walk off stage at Edward High School on graduation day with two pieces of paper. One is an associate's degree, perhaps from the Kent State University uh, Ashton Mueller. Okay, that's sort of the direction we'd like to go. And second is our high school diploma, right? To prepare them to walk into the four-year um, university environment in one of those STEM uh, disciplines to then be successful there, okay? In science, in technology, in engineering, or in mathematics. So that's where we're taking our STEM students. Our third academy is a humanities academy. And within our humanities academy, we want students who are interested in the arts in the social sciences, and we want them to walk through a curriculum that is heavily loaded in advanced courses in the social sciences, in the arts, in English, and so on, communication and, and writing and so forth. We want those students to walk out of the doors of, of uh, Edgewood High School with their high school diploma and a minimum of 15 college credit hours. Okay. And there's, there's a method to our madness when we start talking about college credit hours, we start talking about earning college credit in high school, and here's the method to the madness that we see, that I've seen in, in the literature that's out there. When students graduate from high school with no college credit, with the intent of going to college, okay, their chance of graduating from college is about 50-50, I guess Dr. Stocker probably has a better number than me, but 50-50 is about the number. When they exit college, or when, I'm sorry, when they exit high school with 12 or more hours of college credit, their chance of graduating college is upwards to 75%. So we create for them by demonstrating to them, or them demonstrating to themselves, if you will, that they can do college work. Because sometimes colleges abstract the kids. Nice idea for somebody else. And it's especially abstract in a community where only 20 or 25 percent of their parents have college degrees. You know, we sit in this room today, and my guess is the great majority, if, if we did a, a quick raise of how many people in here have a bachelor's degree or greater, probably, oh, the great majority of hands go up. But in our greater community, in our, in our county, where our kids live, about 20 percent of their parents have college degrees. So the idea of earning a college degree for some of our kids is an abstract. It's something that somebody else does. So through our STEM and our Humanities Academy, when our kids engage in post-secondary opportunities, when they engage in dual enrollment opportunities, when they take AP courses and pass those tests, they demonstrate to themselves they can do college-level work. And college is no longer abstract. College becomes real. And for those kids who want 
to achieve that four-year degree or an advanced degree. That becomes real for them. And we want to send the message to them very clearly that yes, you can do this. And yes, we can help you do this. And we're going to demonstrate it to you now. Uh, recently, the Board of Regents has come out with their new plan for what does the dual enrollment environment look like in, in the uh, colleges. And the Board of Regents, or I should say the Chancellor, is talking about this, this marriage, if you will, between the K-12 environment and the college environment. And it's a marriage that we're trying to make happen in our school district. And I know that Kent State Action Do is trying to make happen as well. Um, but I also know there are other colleges and universities that are on board with this. Um, this whole idea of pulling kids together and preparing them well for that college and beyond environment. It's a college and career readiness kind of approach to things. So in our school district, we've kind of embraced this idea. Three academies, three opportunities for kids. Um, what we know for sure is every one of those kids will be well prepared through the academic curriculum that we offer. Just because you're in the workforce academy doesn't mean you can take less math. It may be different math. A student graduating, the work, graduating from the Workforce Academy needs to earn four credits of mathematics. There will be four credits of mathematics that will, prepare the, that will prepare them well for the workplace, but it will also prepare them well for the college environment if they so choose to make that choice down the road. In the STEM Academy, those four credits of math will include much more advanced math, advanced placement calculus, college level calculus. Um, courses of, of that nature. Right now, at, at our place, we've added a course called Advanced Placement Statistics. Next year, we add Advanced Placement Calculus. Students in the humanities will also have to graduate four credits of math. Their four credits of math may be upper level math, but not at that advanced placement or post-secondary level of mathematics. The goal being that while our kids are going to the Humanities Academy, or they're going to the STEM Academy or the Workforce Academy, we're still going to have them well prepared to enter into the university environment if they so choose at some point down the road. The other thing that we've identified and that we've seen is that college is not a place that just 18 year olds go to. Okay? Uh, college is a place, and it's becoming more and more that place, that 25 year olds go to, and that 30 year olds go to, and 35 year olds, and so on, the non traditional students. So in our work, and I'm going to circle back to our Workforce Academy, in our Workforce Academy, because of our aim at this <coughs> lifelong learning perspective, what we're teaching our students is, yes, you go in at an entry level job at Ashton Chemical, but you also can go into um, take night classes at Kent State University Ashtabula in management. And you move from an entry level employee making $20 an hour or $25 an hour um, <coughs> to a, a management level employee once you earn your degree in management. Um, so they understand that learning becomes a lifelong experience. That's, where our, that's our goal. That's where we're going. We have, it, it's, in our mind, this is a reach and it's an aggressive approach because it is not traditional high school. We are building a schedule around a, a college way of thinking about school, okay? Around a workplace way of thinking about learning, rather than, well, you know, you go to English class and the English teacher spits on you for 45 minutes, spits English on you for 45 minutes, <laughs> then you go to the next place and, wow, okay. Uh, then you go to the next place and that teacher tells you all about US history. We want to create an environment in which kids are interacting with the curriculum. Okay, they understand how to read, write, and communicate effectively through English class. They understand how to use mathematics outside of the world of the classroom. Uh, they will intern with chemical engineers. They will intern with chemical operators who will teach them how to interact with the curriculum they, they learned. In fact, we had a physical science class, and I'll just tell one quick story. We had a physical science class go to um, Ashton Chemicals last spring. And in one of their labs, and, and I was not a science teacher, um, but in one of their labs, uh, the, the scientist, the, the uh, chemical engineer, was talking about how osmosis is used in their manufacturing processes. And it was probably the first time for that group of ninth graders that they recognized and realized that what happens in the classroom actually transfers to what happens outside of the classroom. 
So a major focus of ours is for kids to identify and realize that that's part of what we do. And what you do here matters outside of here. And one of the things we're doing as part of our process is we're introducing our faculty to our partners. We want our faculty to go see these manufacturing facilities, to identify what happens in those manufacturing facilities. Because educators sometimes live in a bubble. And it's a nice bubble, okay? Sort of fun, right? We don't recognize, however, what goes on outside of the bubble. Let's use a snow day. How many of you have a snow day today? Everybody's going to work, right? Okay? Educators think in terms of snow days. Sometimes we think in terms of our classroom as being the end all to be all. And what we want to do by taking our faculty out, and we're taking our high school faculty out to our manufacturing facilities, we're taking our high school faculty out to see and identify what actually goes on in the workplace and how to use that information in their classroom to help our kids become successful. And when our faculty can do that, they become advocates of the manufacturing world. They become advocates of the higher education world. They become advocates of our students. And at the end of the day, when our students have advocates that are their teachers, and they have advocates and mentors that are in the manufacturing workplaces that are in our companies, and when they have um, advocates and mentors like people, like people like you, they begin to realize they can be successful outside of the world of school. So I would urge you to do a couple of things for, for me and for our kids is if you're not part of our partnership, that doesn't mean you can't interact and mentor and help our kids. At Leadership uh, Ashtabula County and the Youth Leadership Program is an example of that. Where I worry about programs like that is what we do, because I, and, and I've observed this in all of the counties in which I've worked, we take the best of kids and we put them in, in these youth leadership programs and the youth leadership programs are spectacular. They're tremendous experiences, but they're tremendous experiences for 25 kids, for 30 kids. What I would like you to do is reach out to maybe those other, oh, I don't know, we have about 600 in our school building. Um, reach out to those other 600 kids and reach out to them and invite them into your world. When we invite kids into our world, when we help kids understand what they can do, who they can become, we invite our future to be bright and promising. And, and what I would suggest to you is, is that's one thing you can always do. The other thing you can do, and this is something that I'll talk about wherever I have an opportunity to talk about it, is take a look at our kids today and feel good about it. You know, some of them dye their hair green. Some of them wear earrings in places they shouldn't wear earrings. Some of them talk in a different kind of language. Some of them wear clothes that you would be caught dead wearing, okay? But what I can tell you for sure, I've been in this business 34 years, right? Some of you, as I look around the room, I could have been your principal, okay? Could have been your teacher, right? And I have news for you. You wore funny clothes too. You did things to your hair that most people wouldn't do. And maybe you didn't wear earrings in funny places, I don't know. But you used a different language than adults. Don't lose sight of the fact that our generation of kids today are every bit as bright every bit as motivated, every bit as skilled as each and every one of us. And we need to lead them down that path. So instead of looking at that, that, that kid in, in the mall or at the store and think, oh my golly, what happened? I want you to think back to 1967, for those of you who think back to 1967, and remember when your hair was this long, fellas, okay? Or ladies, when you the mini skirt, you know, you had the test and you tried to hand the principal, remember? Yeah, but now we're mature adults and we forgot about when we acted maybe a little different, when we acted like teenagers. Okay? Remember, our kids today are just teenagers. They're just kids. And they're acting like kids. And they need us to help them become adults, become mature adults. Don't close them out because they have a Hearing here or there, or we won't come to other places. <laughs> just remember, they were just like you. Hard to believe, but they're just like you, and they need you, and they can use you. So, with that, I don't know how much time I had. I don't know how much time I have left, but I'll answer a question or two. Um, 
Otherwise, we're, we're all set. Yes, ma'am. I would like to know what is the name of the course that teaches them how to arrive to work, and can I teach it? <laughs> <laughs> work, work, our workforce development course is part of, in Workforce Development 2, is when we really look at the soft skills of work, arriving to work on time, dressing for work appropriately, and so forth. Workforce 1, um, it kind of covers a broad range of working topics. And where you might, and we'd be happy to, and this, uh, for anybody in the room, we'd be happy to share our curriculum with you. Um, it's written, it's done, it's completed, um, and we'd be happy to show you just step by step how it works. And just as I mentioned before, all four of the companies that we partner with contributed to the course. Actually, their work is in the course right down to the vocabulary that they use in the workplace. So it's two courses that they take, one semester of the freshman year, one semester of sophomore year. I want to be the leader of changing that term from soft skills because that's what they think of when you tell them it's a soft skill to appear at work every day. That's what's tough for them. That's hard. Oh, that's oh, hard. Getting to work every day is <laughs> difficult. One of the things, uh, excuse me, in our uh, leadership program, our youth leadership program, that we're very proud and like to think of is a little different concept of reaching out to the, the beyond that top 10% of students because we tend to think, you know, there are students that need us even more so and need that, uh, this could be a change, kind of a game changer for them. You know, they experience it and go on to do more in their schools. And our area of challenge um, is consistently in working with guidance because the role of the guidance counselor has evolved so much with, you know, budget cuts and, you know, dollars and, you know, stretching, uh, you know, this, this role, they're teaching classes, they're handling this, they're handling that. And so um, in that, and it's through no fault of any, it's just there is another thing added on to the list. So my question would be, in, um, in this new structure, are there specific guidance, cam guidance counselors set for each of the academies? And if so, are they experiencing going through you know, a specific uh, you know, training program or you know, dealing with or working with that, the student that is going to make that choice? And, it, to be able to offer that level of support and guidance to the students within those academies. What we're doing within the academy, and the exact answer to that is, no, we don't have a counselor for each of the academies. We have three counselors, or we have three academies, two counselors. Um, but the counselors are going to work with every student at the beginning of the school year, midpoint of the school year, and then as they schedule into the next school year to check in on the progress they're making, what they're doing, the ever evolving world of the school counselor. And we have one of ours in the back of the room over there. Shelley is. Um, Shelly Miller is assigned to our elementary schools, but it is an ever-evolving world, and, and we want to create a focus um, that is a focus that prepares kids moving forward. So they're going to interact with our kids three times a year just based on what kind of progress they're making in the academies. So, and it is a challenge for you guys to find those kids that maybe are outside of the, the top 10%. Great. In fact, and what grade are you asking these kids to make that decision? Well, they, make that decision they make that decision walking in in the ninth grade but they have opportunities each year, and that's where our counselors come in. So they make the decision in the ninth grade. At the semester, they sit down with that counselor again, and they check to see if that's still on track, and they can make that change and shift at the semester, and then again at the end of the year. So there's no point where we're gonna to say to them, not unlike the college, there's no point that we're gonna to say to them, you're now stuck, okay? So at two different points at the semester and the end of the year they have the opportunity to adjust each year or just each year every year yes ma'am my my question is um the funding and allocations of funds to each academy is there going to be a differential um funding between workforce stem and the humanities no okay so it's the same number is this a grant no this is work that we decided we wanted to do okay so this is this isn't part of the grant. So is there any long-term accountability? Um, so what does success look like and how, do we, how are we going to measure that long-term? So it's kind of a, my, I'm, I'm a faculty member here and I'm also a parent of Southern Center Expression here next year at, at Edgewood. And so I'm very concerned that, um, you know, what's, what does success look like and what the long-term evaluation of this program will be? Long-term evaluation, we can look at each academy. Long-term evaluation is going to be based on, we'll use the STEM Academy for, for example, is, applications to and um, 
entrance into the STEM disciplines at the four-year uh, university, with the goal being looking at a six-year persistence rate to what, are, how many of our, those kids have actually graduated. Um, and of course, there needs to be benchmarks along the road as we look at their success rate in the post-secondary environment um, while in school in their dual enrollment environment. For the humanities academy, it's a very similar approach. Um, in the workforce academy, it's going to be an employment approach. What percentage of our kids are employed and remain employed for a given period of time? And we'd like to track them um, out. We're, we're, we're shooting for a five-year graduation track. Okay, so our workforce kids, we want to track them for about five years outside of um, the school environment. So, you know, what exactly does that look like as an employment? We'll use as an employment rate. Um, we'll benchmark that against uh, students who didn't, or, or, or employees who didn't go through the academy. So the persistence rate of students, for example, who went through the academy after five years, they're persisting at work at a rate of 75%, and the average um, in Ashtabula County, the persistence rate is 45%. We would say that that's a success, right? But we're building those as we go, and we're building those with our partners as we go. What do those things, what do those things look like? Yes, sir. I wanted to stray away from the academic for a moment. Um, in our first year in the county, in the last century, literally, uh, we had a, our youngest was involved in athletics for Jefferson, and they had a football game against Edgewood, and I proudly told my wife, I know how to get to Edgewood High School. So running late as usual, we arrived uh, 10 minutes before the scheduled start, and there was no football game there because there's no stadium there. Uh, in the physical plan for Edgewood High School, did they ever have an athletic field there in the plans? Or they said, oh yeah, it's miles down that far, but uh, <laughs> obviously we were late. <laughs> I, I might suggest to you, I don't think that is in the near future. Okay. So the, uh, the stadium will, will remain where it's at currently. Okay. <laughs> is there information available or has there been you know, some research or is there research out there about the effects of um, this you know, moving into three different academies? on uh, the social environment in school. Because, you know, being in this uh, universe where we're hearing things and seeing things along the lines of, you know, you hear, uh, there's a lot of the you know, different cliques in high school or you hear about the bullying or all that. So I'm very curious, is there um, some research or some information about that and how, you know, if the school is, does it appear, do they see more of a divided faction or do the kids continue to interact as much as they ever had in the past? Just curious you know, about that social environment. We're not changing the well. physical structure, so right. kids will continue to interact together regardless of the academy. What we've changed basically is their, their curricular program. So while they're taking AP calculus with other kids in the STEM academy, they're still interacting with their friends from the other academies. They're not going anywhere. What we're doing, the academies are not a place, they're a concept. So we don't anticipate that happening. We don't anticipate that, that that happening at all. I know that my time is about up. It's probably nine o'clock till after. Um, happy to talk with you individually after. <coughs> um, but I appreciate the time and the opportunity today. I hope you all have a, a terrific day and, and thank you.